As I had received the Sierra High Route, traversing Timberline Country by Steve Roper for Christmas, naturally I perused it, and in the contagious spirit of adventure, I began to research it and make tentative plans. Over time, with more knowledge and growing excitement, I began to finalize my plans and really get prepared for the trek that has been called the trip of a lifetime. The Sierra High Route takes the traveler through Timberline Country, as the name implies, from Rhodes End Permit Station to Twin Lakes by Bridgeport in approximately 195 stunning miles. With my permit, gear, food, and maps, as well as book, I was ready for my adventure. However, plans, as they usually do, changed. Scrambling, I rerouted my trip to mainly follow the John Muir Trail, with the southern and northern termini the same, and only 30 miles of cross-country travel instead of approximately 160. Among many motivations, the inspiration for this trip derived from the imbalances that I see in daily life and the restorative force of the natural world. Additionally, I desire to gain new perspectives from the powerful experience of being alone in the wilderness. My trip carried out in 13 days, over approximately 180 miles, with one resupply on day 8 in Red's Meadow and a charitable donation of raw cashews received in Tuolumne Meadows. Although physically alone, I brought along poetry and prose pieces to keep me company while out on the trail. In addition, I brought along a digital voice recorder which allowed me to keep more comprehensive notes than a handwritten journal. Most people on the John Muir Trail were headed south to Whitney. This allowed me more solitude as I only encountered four people, which was two different parties, in the first eight days. I leapfrogged with them for a total of about three days, but I essentially walked along the whole time. After the first eight days, I entered a more busy section as day hikers come from Agnew Meadows or from Tuolumne Meadows, as well as some, um, you know, two or three day trip backpackers. So after I passed through Tuolumne and headed north and went cross country, uh, I seldom saw people except for at Saddlebag Lake. After Saddlebag Lake, I didn't see anybody for the next two days until I reached Annette's Mono Village at Twin Lakes. So to add a little bit of nuance to some of the basic themes that the viewer is seeing throughout this film, um, I think they become more dramatic uh, as after this, um, progressing towards the end. So um, I'd like to clarify uh, some ideas so that uh, we end up uh, closer to being on the same page. So, um, basically, many times when somebody heads out into the wilderness, uh, it's viewed as reclusive, especially if uh, he or she is alone, as I was. And I think that it can be seen as a step back from normal life as we know it, um, or how I view it is a step into life, a step into the flow and ebb of life, as I believe John Muir called it. And um, not to say that one is more alive than the other, one version of life, um, to avoid argument here, um, but basically there's two different experiences of life. So, um, hand in hand with that, uh, as I just recently touched on being alone in the wilderness and so I think that's very misconstrued to say that it's reclusive because many times it's not necessarily so. So um, the idea of being alone is uh, pretty interesting and um, as I've read some existentialist works, um, namely by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre or Albert Camus, um, this idea of being alone is really quite fascinating, um, especially in today's world where we're essentially connected, um, you know, by social media and other technologies to everyone else so that, you know, going a day without talking to someone is very rare indeed, uh, or even just going a day without seeing somebody. So. Um, that's something that's really interesting to me. And then just on a more fundamental level of getting to know oneself. And 
Uh, I think that in Sartre's essay, Ex Existentialism is a Humanism, um, it's one of his premises is basically that humans or an individual is essentially alone in the universe. However, as he argues that it is a humanism to refute the critics, um, basically that there are similarities in that um, there are these underlying connections between people. So on the uh, continuum between aloneness and what I will call togetherness, um, I have been thinking that uh, we are, or an individual is more alone than together uh, throughout his or her life. Now, um, I don't want to go into great detail on this, as uh, this really isn't the point of the video, but um, I think that one cannot really understand him or herself. Now, uh, that might be debatable um, in terms of, like, once you get into, like, spirituality and, like, meditation and whatnot, but I'm not uh, an expert on that, so I'll leave that to, to you, the viewer. Um, but basically, you know, we develop physical or psychological ailments, and we are not able to, uh, like we, many times it happens before we can recognize that. So we do not know ourselves that well. And another interesting concept is that um, an individual cannot both know his or her um, self from the inside and from the outside, so internally and externally. So basically, I could think, oh, I'm a pretty funny guy, but I cannot look at myself and say, oh, Sean is a pretty funny guy from the outside, which is entirely different because, you know, what I want to be is not necessarily what I'm perceived to be. And so, kind of a, what nears to be a solution is our interaction with other people. And so, um, if I am spending time with friends and then they're always laughing at things I say, then I'll have a better understanding of them thinking that I'm funny as well as me thinking that I'm funny. But the question is, can this, um, can their understanding of me and my understanding of myself add up to this totality, so to speak, of understanding the individual called Sean? So, um, you know, and then maybe true love adds into that in that two individuals could, uh, so to speak, add up their understanding of each other so well that uh, there is this nice sum of an individual. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a lengthy topic, so um, I'll leave it at that. But um, getting into just spending time in the wilderness uh, alone is that uh, kind of through, kind of in relation to Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, essay, Self-Reliance, basically uh, to step into a different aspect of life and to experience it differently allowed me to um, be with my thoughts in relation to the world that I was experiencing instead of um, what many times happens in quote normal life um, is experiencing it through other people's words, uh, experiencing it as uh, a ex having an experience affected by other people's experience, uh, their experience being their expectations, uh, their interaction, your interaction with other people. So. Um, being alone allows for a more genuine interaction uh, with oneself and uh, the uh, existing environment at that place and time. So in another relation to Emerson's self-reliance, I think that uh, the concept of property is really interesting when uh, that's contextualized 
with backpacking. And backpacking, you're basically reducing your amount of possessions to the amount of stuff that you can carry on your back. Hopefully, a smaller amount than larger amount in interest of uh, carrying heavy weight and bulky items. So, while this is very temporary, in that it's only, you know, a few week, a few days, a few weeks, or months before returning to a house that is full of material possessions, um, it is uh, nonetheless a break from having all these possessions. So being able to carry all one's food, all one's shelter, all one's bedding, one's water, one's filter to pump water, to clean water, is um, I think very liberating and uh, I think it helps to remove us from um, Emerson's idea of um, having as being instead of being as an authentic being. So I wanted to include a few uh, edited pieces from my audio journal so this piece here is Ascent to the Sierras by Robinson Jeffers. Beyond the great valley an odd instinctive rising begins to possess the ground. The flatness gathers to little humps and burrows, low aimless ridges. The sudden violence of rock crowns them. The crowded orchards end. They have come to a stone knife. The farms are finished. The sudden foot of the Sierra. Hill over hill. Snow ridge beyond mountain, gather the blue air of their height about them. Here at the foot of the pass, the fierce clans of the mountain you'd think for thousands of years. Men with harsh mouths and eyes like the eagle's hunger have gathered among these rocks at the dead hour of the morning star and the stars waning to raid the plain and at moonrise returning driven their sacred booty to the highlands. The tossing horns and glazed eyes and the light of torches. The men have looked back, standing above these rock heads, to bark laughter at the burning granaries and the farms and the town that sow the dark flat land with terrible rubies, lighting the dead. It is not true. From this land the curse was lifted, the highlands have kept peace with the valleys. No blood in the sod. There is no old sword keeping grim rust, no primal sorrow. The people are all one people. Their homes never knew harrying. The tribes before them were acorn eaters, harmless as deer. O oh, fortunate earth, you must find someone to make you bitter music. How else will you take bonds of the future? against the wolf in men's hearts. I was born never to lose I've been dead for 60 years I was just a young boy in my 20s The day I disappeared Into the grand school on a badland Utah and Arizona line And they never found my body, boys Or understood my mind I grew up in California And I loved my family and home And I ran off to the high Sierras I could be free and alone 
And the folks said he's just another wild kid You go out of it in time But they never found my body boy Or understood my mind Broncos with the Cowboys Sang the healing songs of the Navajo Did the snake dance with the Hopi I grouped pictures everywhere I'd go Then I swapped all my drawings for provisions Give what I needed to get by And they never found my body boys Or understood my mind Will I hate your crowded cities With your sad and hopeless mob Couldn't I hate your grand cathedral where you try to trap God Cause I know God is here in the canyons With the rattlesnakes and pinion pines And they never found my body boys Or understood my mind they say I was killed by a drifter Or I froze to death in the snow Maybe mauled by a wildcat Or I'm living down in Mexico But my end, it really doesn't matter I wanted to uh, share this poem that I found out here. Uh, found out on the peaks and uh, whatnot. So, um, I want to It's called The Hermit Song. Shattered knife blade peaks, cutting through ominous clouds, slitting the wind into a shriek and a howl. Shedding their black reptilian towers into talus, asking permission from no one, and granting it to nobody, as they define the valleys below. Verdant pastures speckled with grazing livestock, huts with barricaded walls and noisy lights, act as the mark of the human. For here, life seems bountiful, where snow falls infrequently, where waters flow through the fields and freely into the mouths of the thirsty. And the air, the air is full of the chit-chatter of chickadees, the banter of blue jays, and the caw of the crow. Where the ground crawls with life, teeming with insects, larvae, spiders, flowers, grass, trees rise, trees fall. The valleys seldom truly look to the mountains, the mountains that seem so full of death, Snow-strewn, wind-whipped ridges of rotting rock, and glistening towers of granite. Deadly to all those who pass, whether their first time or after many. But here in the mountains, these cold mountains, hold my heart warm. For here the mountains hide no hearts. These mountains show their hearts in their ridges, coals, cornices, spires, cirques, passes. These mountains hold their cold hearts out to humans, many turn away. But here in the mountains, these cold mountains, hold my heart warm. In the valleys below, the hearts of humans, shadowed, kept behind closed doors, shuttered windows. For here, humans have buried their hearts in the valleys. Only when one thinks they have found someone's heart, 
do they find? The valleys warm, hold hearts cold.